Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this virtual town hall to discuss the development of a temporary emergency micro shelter site at 623 East 60th Street. We are pleased to see so many of you joining us today. We know that this is a different setting than our typical community meetings. So before we get started, there are some technical pieces I would like you to know. This event is being recorded and will be made available for those who are not able to attend at this time. If you would like to ask a question, please look for the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Our moderator will be passing your questions on to our staff panelists throughout the evening. You can ask general questions or you can direct questions to a specific staff panelist. This virtual T-Town Hall event is also being translated into Spanish in real time. To listen to the discussion in Spanish, you will need to be using the most recent version of the Zoom app. Please look for the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom window and select Spanish to hear the interpreter. Please note that the information you're using to access this virtual T-Town Hall via Zoom is subject to future public disclosure requests. In addition to our panelists who will be leading the discussion and fielding questions, Council Members Beal and Ashka are on the call to hear resident questions and concerns. Before we get started, I'd like to offer the council member an opportunity to make some remarks. Council Member Beal. Well, thank you, Allison, and uh, thank everybody in the, in the community for joining us. I see a, a very healthy attendee list, and, and I know with uh, all of the issues that are going on in our community, uh, with the civil unrest and uh, protests um, and many other things that are going on in our community right now, uh, I know that uh, folks on the council and Mayor Woodards, who is unfortunately not able to be here with us tonight, she did plan on attending, um, but she is uh, also leading our city through this uh, very difficult time. And um, she actually did prepare a statement for us, uh, which I'll get into. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank folks uh, during this time, and, and, and I know this is a, a very difficult time for many people in our community. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your time and your attention to this very important community topic. Um, so Councilmember Ushka will, will follow um, some of my remarks here, uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the discussion tonight, which is a presentation by our staff and our operator uh, with, low, with the uh, Low Income Housing Institute. So um, first I wanted to read a prepared statement from our mayor, Victoria Woodards. Um, again, she did plan on attending tonight. Um, uh, the recent events that are going on in our community have uh, derailed that plan, but uh, she was able to prepare a statement uh, that I want to read because I believe it's important too. Uh, despite that's all that's going on in our world and across our nation and in our community, the city remains committed to meeting with our residents and business owners on important issues, as we are doing tonight. Due to the current restrictions on gathering, we are hosting tonight's conversation virtually. Uh, we recognize that there are some limitations to this platform, but we're also excited that it offers an opportunity for people who may not be able to attend in-person meetings to participate. I think we've learned a lot because of uh, the uh, pandemic and the T-Town Hall has provided uh, an opportunity for that platform to be tested. The topic of tonight's conversation is providing safe and secure uh, shelter for our unhoused neighbors and our people in our community that are experiencing homelessness. It's an important one, especially given a recent economic impacts on all of us uh, that we come together to look for ways to support the most vulnerable in our community. Expanding available shelter beds is one step the city is taking to reduce, to realize our vision that no resident in Tacoma is unhoused. We all have a right to feel safe in our community. When we opened our first location uh, of our, um, our, our tiny house concept in the Hilltop in December of 2019, I know, the mayor, uh, many neighbors uh, had the same questions that you all have tonight, and I heard those as well. Uh, we have seen that that site has integrated well with the surrounding neighborhood, and I'm looking forward to similar results at this new location. Uh, so that concludes uh, the mayor's remarks for tonight. I, I think that's a really good table setter, and, and we're, we're very happy that the mayor was able to provide that. As you all know, or may know, um, the mayor also lives in, in South Tacoma, so she uh, does live in the proximity uh, to this location. Um, I think it's important to uh, remember that we do have a current model for uh, uh, this type of uh, emergency micro shelter housing in our community already. Uh, we have a location at 8th and Martin Luther King Way 
um, that's currently operating, uh, has been operating, as the mayor said in her prepared statement, since December of 2019, and has really been um, a really good model for uh, temporary housing uh, for folks that are experiencing homeless in our, homelessness in our community. Um, as the mayor mentioned, you know, we had a lot of concerns going into that. We had uh, really a crisis of public safety and public health at People's Park. And uh, the site at 8th and MLK was part of that mitigation strategy. And I think it was a successful part of that mitigation strategy, as we've seen. So we have a successful model that is uh, looking for uh, a move because these are temporary sites. We, we do not intend for these to be uh, located in one single site forever. Uh, but we are uh, working already with the Low Income Housing Institute, uh, commonly called Lehigh. Uh, and Lehigh staff is uh, going to be part of the presentation tonight. You know, we've really got a trusted partner with a proven model. This is not a new model. Um, Lehigh has done this across the region for many, many years in many, many different sites um, and does have a proven model for not only um, helping folks who are experiencing homelessness to uh, regain some dignity and some safety while they try to get themselves back on their feet, um, but it also allows for the community to integrate in with that model uh, and listen in and be part of that. Um, and I think what we've seen downtown, downtown or Hilltop, I should say, uh, is a really successful model that has done that very well. Um, I know in talking to Council Member Ushka and I's colleague, Keith Blocker, who represents District 3 in the Hilltop, you know, a lot of people had concerns. We had as many people uh, show up for public outreach for that event. And he has, has told me he hasn't had one complaint and we've only had a very small few number of calls for service for that facility. Um, so we really do have a, a trusted partner who runs a proven model for this um, type of emergency um, housing. So um, I think that we do have a, a really good lineup here tonight that's going to to speak to this issue and really answer your questions and receive your feedback. Uh, I'm excited. I'm, I'm very happy that you're all joining us here virtually. I see uh, over 100 people that are on our attendee list. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time and your attention uh, to this model. I think Councilmember Ushka and I are, are um, excited to hear back from you. Um, we're excited at the, the opportunity that this uh, affords our neighborhood, and we want to listen. We want to hear what the feedback is, um, and we want to continue to monitor this uh, site and the situation to make sure that it, it really integrates in well, as we've seen in, in uh, the Hilltop, uh, and really uh, continue to engage with the community uh, in ways that um, uh, help this site be successful and help our neighbors uh, who are experiencing homelessness to get themselves back on their feet uh, and back into stable housing. So um, I think that's it. I think I'm gonna conclude my remarks here and uh, hand it over to Councilmember Ushka. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Beal. And I wanna reiterate my gratitude for the 116 of you that I see on the line today. Um, I appreciate your commitment and concern for our neighborhood and taking the time to come to this town hall tonight. It is important. Um, I've received a lot of feedback on this, as Council Member Beal mentioned, and I, I want you to know that we've definitely been listening. I think um, it's challenging, particularly during COVID. I know that as an Eastside resident myself for the last 20 years, uh, we frequently feel as Eastsiders that things uh, are going to happen to us. And, and that's sometimes real and sometimes not real. Um, I hear that, and, and I, I know that I want you to know that the city did attempt to do uh, site outreach throughout the city and in the midst of COVID, it was very difficult to do. Um, they were offered this site for free from THA and it is a temporary site. And I know I've gotten feedback that has said that, that you don't believe that it's really gonna be temporary. And I, and I understand that concern. Um, I have reiterated with my council members and with staff as of others, it's temporary no longer than December of 2021. Um, that's currently because uh, that's when THA intends to use the property, but we also have the commitment from the city that that's when we're going to stop having it here. Um, today I was answering an email and somebody asked me, how will we know that the temp site, site is temporary? And in fact, the T in temp site stands for temporary. Um, I want to welcome you to hold Chris and I accountable to that as, as we will hold the city accountable to that. The challenge for serving people with disability, not with homeless, experiencing homelessness in our community is tremendous. And it is one that um, the East Side has stepped up to do already. Um, and I appreciate the goodwill of all of our neighbors. Um, there is work that I think that the city will talk to more about looking at sites throughout the city 
outside of a COVID situation where we can't do the kind of outreach that we would normally want to do. The other thing that I've heard people talk about is concerns about uh, already existing challenges in the neighborhood and concerns that this will add to it. And I want to really underscore the fact that uh, if I wasn't familiar with the fantastic work of Lehigh and their work on the Hilltop site already, I would share your concerns. Um, they have been outstanding, not just in helping the people serve there, but helping people around there. And you'll hear uh, information about how well they've managed to get people into housing that were there before. So this temporarily also increases everybody's eyes on that location. And I know along the train tracks, there's been concerns about different encampments. But we have an opportunity to have more eyes and more partners in addressing those issues. Um, and I hope that you'll join me in trying to embrace that and meeting challenges, we hit them. In the end, um, it's a pandemic and we have neighbors experiencing homelessness and we must make sure that they have shelter. Uh, and with that, my notes went away, but I think that pretty much sums up where I wanna be, except to tell you that Chris and I are here listening. Uh, you can reach either one of us by phone or email and uh, we will stay beside you throughout this process till December 2021. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Allison Griffith. Thank you, Councilmember Ishka. I'm going to reshare my screen. So everyone will just stand by with me for one second. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that may have tuned in while the council members were speaking that uh, you can ask a question or provide a comment to us by looking for the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. A moderator will be passing your questions and comments onto our panelists throughout the evening. You can ask a general question or you can direct questions to a specific panelist. If you are listening in on the phone and have a question, you may email shelters at cityoftacoma.org and staff will pass that question to the moderator. You also have the option of asking questions in Spanish. We may not be able to get to all of your questions this evening. A summary of questions and answers will be posted on the city's website at www.cityoftacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments and distributed to our listserv for this project. If you wish to subscribe to receive updates, you may also email the shelter email at shelters at cityoftacoma.org to be added to that list. Now I would like to introduce Linda Stewart, the Director of Neighborhood and Community Services, to begin our presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Allison. Uh, I am Linda Stewart. I'm the Director of Neighborhood and Community Services here at the City of Tacoma. And I first of all want to um, acknowledge uh, the efforts of, of everyone to be here tonight. I see now uh, in excess of 120 participants on the call. I want to let you know how much uh, we at the City and the Low Income Housing Institute appreciate everyone tuning in uh, to participate tonight. Uh, Neighborhood and Community Services is the department that has the primary responsibility for managing the city's response to homelessness. The city is currently operating under two declarations of emergency that relate to the establishment of this temporary micro shelter site. A little bit of history. Um, in May of 2017, the city declared a public health state of emergency related to homelessness and encampments. The initial declaration stemmed from the presence of encampments throughout the city, including a large encampment uh, located on Portland Avenue. Through that emergency declaration, the city established the stability site, which is currently located at 1423 Puyallup Avenue. Since the initial declaration of emergency, the city has extended it twice um, as we continue to face adverse public health effects related to the presence of encampments and individuals experiencing homelessness. In late 2019, uh, the council added a performance metric to the declaration of emergency that requires access to shelter for 95% of individuals counted in the annual point in time count for three consecutive years. In a moment, I'll touch on our number of, of available shelter beds, uh, but what we do know is that we don't have enough available shelter to meet the needs of our unhoused community members, and the expansion of available shelter beds is critical to assisting us in addressing this emergency. In addition to the state of emergency and homelessness, 
we've also declared a public health emergency related to COVID-19. In traditional shelter settings, shelters often provided only overnight and often in settings where everyone uh, or several clients are located in one room together. Under the COVID emergency, the city has a directive to develop what is called non-congregate shelter, which allows individuals to shelter in place and allow for appropriate six foot social distancing. Shelter in place means that they're able to stay in one place. They don't need to uh, come and go um, uh, check into somewhere at night and have to leave during the day. In addition to expanding some of our existing shelter operations to 24 hours a day, seven uh, days a week to allow individuals to shelter in place, the development of this particular micro shelter site will assist the city in meeting non congregate shelter directives. So as I mentioned, uh, we know that there that we are short on the number of shelter beds uh, that we need to serve people experiencing homelessness in our community. We currently have about 600 available beds in the community and are expecting an additional 50 uh, beds to come online at the Tacoma Rescue Mission uh, quite soon. The particular endeavor we're uh, discussing tonight, um, if developed at full capacity, will add about 30 additional beds to that system. We are already working at a deficit to meet the need in our community and the current pandemic and resulting economic crisis is increasing housing instability in our community. As we work to develop housing for low income households as well as longer term solutions like permanent supportive housing, we are also looking uh, to develop shelter locations that meet the immediate needs of individuals experiencing homelessness. Now the city continues to work with faith based and nonprofit partners to identify possible shelter locations and is committed to focusing on locations currently underserved by shelter. Sheltering individuals in a safe, secure, and managed environment mitigates the impacts of homelessness for individuals and our community. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Allison, uh, who is the project leader, uh, to discuss both the city's experience with the current micro shelter site at 8th and MLK, as well as some features of the site being proposed for 623 East 60th. Go ahead, Allison. I apologize for the delay. Uh, prior to discussing the proposed location at 623 East 60th, I would like to share some outcomes of the current site at 802 Martin Luther King. This site opened in December 2019, and as Linda referenced, the development and implementation of these sites occurs very quickly. In the case of 802 MLK, the site was established in just 41 days as an emergency response to encampment location at People's Park. Since that site opened, it has served 63 clients, 12 of whom have transitioned into permanent housing. In a moment, Low Income Housing Institute will touch on the required code of conduct for their micro shelter sites, but it is important to note that 100% of residents located at 802 MLK are complying with that code of conduct and are working with case managers. Six of the clients currently located there at 802 MLK are employed and 23 are engaged in recovery services. As of May 22nd, there had been 14 calls for service to the site, two calls for Tacoma Police Services, and the remainder, 12, for Tacoma Fire EMS Services. As Councilmember Beal touched on, that's a relatively low number of calls for service. Now to turn to the proposed site at 623 East 60th. The current site at 802 MLK must relocate to allow for the development of property into senior housing. Additionally, as Linda discussed, the city's response to COVID-19 demands that we look for a new location to expand our available shelter space. The Tacoma Housing Authority was willing and able to make their property available for use, and on May 8th of this year, staff briefed council about this as an option for shelter expansion. On May 19th, Council approved staff to enter into a lease agreement with the Tacoma Housing Authority for the use of the property. Since discussion with Council on May 8th, staff has been responding to questions and comments from area business owners and residents, and staff remains available to attend meetings and answer questions, and I will share my contact information at the end of the presentation for that purpose. 
as indicated here on the schedule, site setup will begin this month. For those on the call interested in volunteering to assist with construction of the micro shelters or furniture for those shelters or providing donations, we will provide contact information at the end of the presentation. We anticipate that site setup will be substantially complete and transition of residents from 8th and MLK to this new site will occur by the end of July. We expect the site to be fully operational beginning in August and operating until, the, until December of 2021. Importantly, and you see it here on the slide, the shelters will be removed and site returned to THA for future development in December 2021. I shared earlier some of the successes of the current site. Part of that success is due to the operational model that the Low Income Housing Institute, or LEHI, brings. A contract with LEHI for operation of the site will be forthcoming to Council for authorization. Importantly, there is 24-7 on-site staff to assist with safety and security of residents, as well as security cameras throughout the site. The site is fully fenced with controlled access entry, and on-site services include restrooms, showers, and laundry, as well as space for case management, a communal kitchen, which will have three meals per day served, as well as trash and recycling services on site. The site will contain ADA pathways, and each micro shelter unit can be outfitted with a ramp to allow ADA access as necessary. We have talked about the site location as East 60th and McKinley, but the address of the site is 623 East 60th. And to better orient you, we will be using two parcels on the western portion of the site toward the railroad's tracks. There is a significant amount of construction equipment and activity on a parcel located closer to the intersection of East 60th and McKinley. So I want to make clear that this is a laydown yard for construction currently occurring on East 64th Street. No construction activity is currently underway on the proposed micro shelter site. So this diagram here again shows where the proposed micro shelter site is closest to the railroad tracks, as well as the East 64th Street construction lay down. They're more near the intersection of East 60th and McKinley. <clears throat> Just to give an orientation to this diagram here, this is East 60th Street. So we flipped a little bit from the previous picture that you could see. We are still evaluating the site for capacity. The diagram here shows the proposed layout at a maximum capacity of 50 units. Under no scenario will the site have more than 50 micro shelter units, and it may have fewer. The maximum number of individuals that will be served on site at any given time will not exceed 65. As previously discussed, there are restroom, shower, laundry, dining, and counseling facilities, which are represented by the blue boxes on this diagram. I would now like to hand the presentation to Josh Castle with the Low Income Housing Institute to describe Lehigh's history and the management model that they bring to locations like these. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Castle. I'm the Community Engagement Director with the Low Income Housing Institute. I'm also here with Eric Davis, who's the manager of the Thames site, some other colleagues from Lehigh, and two residents who will share some words with us a little bit later. Eric, Eric my colleague John uh, Brown, and I have had several conversations with the neighbors prior to this, and I just wanna thank everyone for being so engaged and talking with us about your questions, concerns, and ideas. I also wish we could all be together in a room and I just wanna thank everyone for being patient with this virtual format, which we're all kind of, get, kind of getting used to. I'm going to share some brief words about Lehigh and our program and then pass it over to Eric to tell you more about the site itself. So Lehigh is a 28 year affordable housing nonprofit. We own and manage 65 buildings and 2,300 units of housing, including two affordable housing apartment buildings in Pierce County. Rainier View Apartments in Puyallup, serving low-income seniors, and Sunset Meadows Apartments, serving individuals, couples, and families who were previously experiencing homelessness. About four and a half years ago, we started partnering with cities 
to set up and operate tiny house villages for people experiencing homelessness and to help the clients of these villages gain stability and on a path to permanent housing. Lehigh operates or supports 12 micro villages, including nine in Seattle, um, one enhanced building shelter in Seattle as well, two villages in Olympia, and then of course the current one in, in Tacoma. These provide shelter for about a thousand individuals annually, including families, couples, and people with pets. Our case managers work with the residents of all the villages to obtain housing, employment, health care, and other services. And they've successfully moved over 650 village residents into permanent housing since the tiny house program began in 2016. I now want to pass it over to Eric to tell you a little bit more about um, how the management of the site works, and then he will introduce you to the residents. Thank you. And Eric is probably struggling to unmute himself right now. Hi guys, my name is Eric Davis. Can you see me there? It's not showing. Uh, my name is Eric Davis. I'm the special projects manager for the sites. And uh, the main thing about the village is to get people structured and clean and sober. One of the things we do here is to provide a safe and sober environment. It's very important to encourage the residents uh, in a simple manner. So when people first come in, they're a little sheltered, they're a little afraid, but uh, the way we do things is we talk to them as, they, as though they were my brother or my sister. What I mean by that is my job is to encourage and motivate each and every single individual here. And uh, along the way, we teach them life skills. We teach them to be loving of themselves. Uh, the transition that goes through while we're here is getting to know one another and getting to know oneself and to work together as a community. The time we spent here was beautiful, man. It was just a transformation of people who thought they didn't know each other but found out they had a lot in common. And so what we do is we work as a team. In the beginning, you struggle a little bit but it's because one doesn't know one another. But again, I bridge that gap. I make everyone feel welcome. And uh, the community itself around has helped a lot with that. I'd like to really thank our surrounding neighbors and our donors around here. They've come to this gate with many, many, many gifts and they've made us feel welcome. In turn, the residents felt more at ease. So um, again, we have a, a structured code of conduct, which we enforce strictly, but civilly. Uh, we don't allow the use of drugs and alcohol here. We do background checks. We understand that there are neighbors who are concerned about uh, schools and, and things of that nature. So we're concerned as, as you are. And we want to encourage you that uh, we just want to be neighbors just like you. If you have any concerns, please come down and share with us. I'm always open to talk with you. Thank you so much, guys. Um, Josh, you want to talk about the CAC? Thank you, Eric. So I want to share with you that uh, all the villages um, have a community advisory committee and this one as well. We just actually met earlier this week. Um, this community advisory committee is made up of neighborhood stakeholders who monitor the progress of the village, check in on how the staff and residents are doing and make sure that uh, any concerns or ideas or questions um, from the public and from the immediate neighborhood and the businesses are addressed. These are made up of immediate neighbors near next to the village, uh, businesses, faith organizations, chambers of commerce, local neighborhood committees, providers, schools, um, and everyone who is um, who is near near the village. So anyone who is who is at all um, uh, impacted by it um, would be would be uh, invited to to sit on the committee and to meet um, with the other committee members monthly to go over the progress of the village. These are uh, committees that are, um, they provide a great resource for the public to have their questions answered, have their con concerns addressed. If people have offers of uh, donations or they wanna volunteer, they can go through this committee. And 
it is welcome and open to the public. Anybody can attend. Um, and the minutes are posted on the city's website so you can always see what's going on if you happen to miss a meeting. Our next meeting coming up, and again, these are public meetings, so you're all welcome to come, is on June 30th at, at 5 p.m. We're doing it on Zoom, of course. So if anyone is interested, please let us know. And our contact information is listed at the end of this presentation. Thank you. In talking with neighbors in the last few weeks, I've received several questions about encampments present in the neighborhood or property owners having concerns about uh, loitering and other illicit behavior on their property. I wanna make sure that residents are aware that they always may contact 311 to have our homeless outreach team make contact with in individuals in encampments. Further, I wanted to make sure and share with business owners that they may contact Positive Interactions at 253-396-5065 for response to their business to assist with individuals experiencing homelessness, particularly at their business location. Positive Interactions will make contact and connect individuals to resources. As Josh talked about, uh, his contact information is here and he is available and willing to answer any questions or concerns you may have regarding either the 8th and MLK site or the site uh, proposed for 60th and McKinley. Um, I will read out his email address and phone number for those that may be listening on the phone. Josh, J-O-S-H dot Castle at Lehigh, L-I-H-I dot O-R-G or 206-443-9935. Additionally, if you have questions or concerns about this site, or if you're interested in other neighborhood resources, have questions about, you know, uh, if you would like a crime prevention through environmental design review of your property, or you would like connection with uh, Adopt-a-Spot programming, community cleanup programming, those are all questions that have come to me from the neighborhood. Uh, you may write either shelters at cityoftacoma.org, or call me at 253-591-5119. And again, that's 253-591-5119. I'm going to pass it to Kenny, our moderator now, to begin. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I also wanted to make sure that we touched on ways to get involved, to volunteer or donate. Um, you may contact tinyhouses at lehigh.org. And then Josh touched on the formation of the Community Advisory Committee, which again, you may visit www.cityoftacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments, both to apply to the Community Advisory Committee, as well as to review meeting agendas and minutes from the current Community Advisory Committee that's occurring uh, at 8th and MLK. Also, you may visit that website to subscribe to our listserv regarding this project, and we will send you ongoing email updates. Um, so now I would like to pass it to Kenny, our moderator, to begin asking questions or reading out comments that are appearing in our Q&A box so that we may make sure that we're responding to the community questions and concerns. Allison, this is Josh. Um, there's actually a, a couple of a resident or two that wanted to just say something really quick. Is that okay? Yes, please. I would. Let, I think it's important, Josh. Thank you. Uh, that these are residents currently located at the Eighth and MLK site, correct? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Please thank go you. ahead. Eric's going to unmute himself in a second. Thank you. All righty. What happened? Are we there? You're on. All right. Just a moment. I'm going to have to introduce you to Ronald Brown. Have a seat, Ron. Go for it. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ronnie Brown. Five months ago, I was living in my vehicle. I was suffering from PTSD, depression, and all of the above. And I got a call from Ann Artman from the Recovery Cafe, who I worked with years ago. And she mentioned to me about the tiny houses. So I got on the list, got in. And uh, since I've been here, I've got a handle on my PS PTSD, because I am an Army vet as well. And uh, life has been 
a joy. Uh, I have a supporting cast. I've got a foundation support system now. Uh, in fact, I brought my friend with me. He's next door to me. He got his driver's license back. Uh, I'm now employed. Uh, like I said, without the help of, of, of the staff and the case management here, this would have never happened. So it was great to have a support system, something I have a hard time asking for, but it worked out here. Uh, I also want to thank the city and everybody out there that made this happen because I see a lot of lives being changed here. So that's all I have right now. All right, next stop is now. Hi, how are you guys doing? My name is Chanel. I'm going to take off her mask. <laughs> Chanel Waters, and um, did I just continue to go on? I am a resident here at the Tiny Homes, have been for about five months. Um, if it wasn't for the Tiny Homes, I'd still be living in my car. Uh, the thing about this place has been a, a grateful opportunity for not only me, for people here to be able to get on their feet and actually um, get their lives back in order. And thanks to this housing institute and the opportunities that they provide, um, I'm able to do so and, and get into housing in the future here, near future. So I really like the place. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'll pass this back over to Kenny. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ronnie and Chanel. I didn't know y'all would be sharing, and I, I really appreciated that myself, so thank you. Um, I'm going to get to as many questions as we possibly can. We're going to try to give ourselves 30, 35 minutes to go through questions, so I'll encourage um, experts to try to have short answers if you can, but of course give as full answers as needed. Um, Allison, let's start with you. We got this question in many forms. Um, so I'm going to read Daniel's, but we got a lot of people asking something similar. I am concerned about the lack of resources in the area. We want the residents to be successful in moving from emergency housing to permanent housing, but the area has no clinic, no AA, and is a food desert. How will the city address these issues for the residents? Thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Daniel, and those who've asked those questions. We very much appreciate them. Uh, in looking at locating on this site, those types of concerns were absolutely something that we've worked with Lehigh to think about how we are going to address them. Um, one, that's one of the important reasons that we will be serving three meals a day on site. We've made that adjustment um, so that folks do have access to food on site. In addition, uh, there will be two case managers on site and case management will actually be provided on site. There may be some uh, reason that residents need to leave the site to access clinics and things like that. We'll work with Low Income Housing Institute to arrange transportation for those needs, but primarily um, needs will be able to be met on site either by uh, what Lehigh brings or what their partnerships will bring to the site to make those residents successful. Thanks, Allison. And I just want to remind people, I'm going to read comments as well. So if you have something you would like to share with our council members and our staff, please do. I'm going to start with a comment from Ramona and um, turn it into a question because we got a lot of related questions. So this question from James and Ramona says, um, they, that they live in the neighborhood, we do not support the city decision to build low income housing or um, homelessness services in our community. The location is across the street from a daycare sandwiched between three elementary schools. Concordian, Sheridan, and Fawcett. We would like to protest the location and fill it, um, and it should be located instead in the North End. We support all homelessness services and, and people experiencing homelessness and have empathy for their conditions. And that leads me to a question that we got from a lot of people. Why did we choose this location instead of um, the North End in particular is what most people are saying. Allison, can you speak to that or call on someone else to speak to that? Absolutely, Kenny, and um, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly, um, siting of shelter location causes concern for any community uh, that we work with, and um, Council Member Ushka in particular touched on at the beginning of the presentation concerns about um, why the East Side in particular. Um, 
the uh, city of Tacoma is a developed city. So in almost any location we were to look at, there will be uses around uh, any site that may uh, seem somewhat incompatible with the services that uh, will be provided on the site. Um, in this case, uh, Tacoma Housing Authority did have uh, available undeveloped property that they were willing and able to make available to us. And as touched on, um, at uh, no cost for the lease uh, for that property. So that was one of the driving factors in this case. And that is a driving factor for location of any shelter uh, site is that we must have a willing property owner. Um, as touched on in the presentation, we are working to identify locations for shelter in underserved areas of the community, including the West End and the North End. And we are considering locations in both of those geographies um, going forward. So we absolutely hear the concerns of the community and we do want to make sure that we're distributing uh, our shelter locations throughout the city. So I know um, that it's a question and concern for many residents and it is something we are actively working towards uh, providing throughout the city. My next question is for Josh and forgive me, I'm probably going to ask questions that go over things you already went over, but I think it's important to reiterate them. Um, Josh, will the McKinley site be dry housing or wet housing? And could you define those terms? What does the code of contact that you mentioned consist of? There's no drugs or alcohol allowed in public spaces, and the entire village is a public space. So residents sign a code of conduct. They agree to that right from the start, and we strictly, we strictly um, enforce that so a, a resident for some reason is, is um, not, um, not abiding by that. We have to have a, a conversation with them about um, if there's another program that would better meet their needs. Eric, did you wanna talk about that? We'll wait for Eric to come back on, but I hope that um, that helps. There's no, there's no drugs or alcohol out. Oh, there he is. I think he's... Eric, your sound is off, but you're not muted, so there must be some kind of technical issue. So Josh, I'm gonna move on to the next question for now. Um, and it's actually still for you. We had numerous questions about cleanup. So this one from Anderson asks, can we discuss a cleanup plan and continued maintenance along the railroad tracks and surrounding area? And can you speak to um, cleanup in general? We got a lot of questions about that. Absolutely. So the residents that live at um, the Thames site, they're, they're all signed up. It's, all, it's also part of the code of conduct and it's a part of the expectation of living there that they're gonna do um, they're going to be involved in helping with uh, with the village and with the community, the surrounding community. So they help with chores, um, and they also help with things like um, litter pickup in the in the surrounding community. Uh, the and then the the security um, does perimeter checks around the area as well. So they they keep an eye out on that. Um, and we in at many of our many of our villages, well, all of our villages actually, and um, the one at um, at Tacoma. Um, the residents are involved in a lot of community beautification projects. So they work with the neighbors, the businesses, uh, the faith organizations in, uh, in community cleanup. So we want to make sure that um, any, you know, any neighborhood that a, that a village is, is in um, is actually cleaner and safer than, than, it, than it was before. So we're committed to that. And Kenny, if I could just contribute to that, um, we've actually already had several of the neighborhood groups in the area indicate to us that they would like to organize cleanups along the railroad. So we are working with Tacoma Rail to look at how we can do that in a safe and appropriate manner. Um, as we know, of course, cleaning up along the railroad is difficult when the rail is active and running. So if there are neighbors that haven't been connected um, with their safe streets groups or their neighborhood groups and would like to participate in something like that, they are more than welcome to call me at 253-591-5119 and I can connect them into those neighborhood efforts that are occurring. Thank you. And just a reminder, we have 72 questions already. So 
We are definitely not going to get to all the questions today, but we are committed to getting answers for all your questions. So we will post them um, with the video later. Um, here's a comment from Jeff. He says, I'm a lifelong Tacoma resident and business owner. I'm proud to be associated with Eric Davis, Ronnie Brown, and the team working to give respectful shelter to people experiencing homelessness at 8th and MLK. I will continue to support Thames and recruit others to do the same, regardless of the location. I want to thank and congratulate the city, the mayor, and council members for their courage to provide this opportunity to those in need. You have my full support on this measure. Um, we'll go back and forth. We'll share some happy comments and some constructive comments as well. Um, our next one qu question, um, we'll send this to Allison. Uh, we got a lot of questions asking about um, being close to uh, schools. So um, this one's mentioning that it's asking if there are any concerns about being two blocks from an elementary school and they're concerned that you don't care about our kids. Thank you, Kenny. Um, we can absolutely appreciate. And as I said, um, any location for shelter in the city of Tacoma is likely going to be located in places where we may have what appear to be conflicting uses in the nearby area. Um, what, as Council Member Ushka touched on in her commentary at the beginning of the presentation, um, we uh, are concerned about what the neighborhood is concerned about, and we believe that actually implementation of this type of site brings additional eyes to the neighborhood in terms of um, both uh, enforcement from uh, Tacoma Police Department, but also concerned neighbors. And I know that both the council members have extended themselves to be held accountable for what occurs on site and what the surrounding behavior is. And I know that those council members will um, in turn hold staff accountable. And that uh, primarily comes down to, frankly, me. I have the uh, responsibility to manage the contract with Low Income Housing Institute and to ensure that we are operating in a safe, an appropriate manner. So um, I would also uh, welcome any neighborhood that wants to have a more um, specific discussion about your concerns about a specific school location and what we might do um, from that perspective uh, to talk about routing and to talk about, hey, if you end up having a particular issue on site, such as loitering or congregation or anything like that, we can address those as those issues uh, arise. So thank you. Thank you, Allison. This might be for you as well, or maybe Linda. Um, this, oh, and just so you know, this is being broadcast live on VT Radio, which is a local partner who um, does a lot of Spanish programming, a grassroots radio station. And so we're getting questions in Spanish from their audience. So this is one of the questions that we got in Spanish. I'll read it to you in English, if that helps. Um, uh, near the Guadalupe house, um, on that street in Tacoma, there are many people experiencing homelessness. Um, is there a plan to involve these folks in this project or to help them? Absolutely. Kenny, I can start that uh, answer. And if Linda has anything else to add that I missed, she's absolutely welcome to contribute. But um, we are in consistent conversation with neighbors along G Street in particular, which is the street uh, adjacent to Guadalupe House there. Um, and, and they do have some specific challenges. The site at uh, East 60th and McKinley, um, when operational, of course, will both involve the movement of folks and transition of folks located at 8th and MLK if they would like to transition to that new site, but also will be open for actually direct referral from our homeless outreach team. So as our homeless outreach team is making contact with individuals in encampments, whether along uh, G Street there or other encampments in the city, they will have the opportunity to make direct referral to the East 60th and McKinley site to offer individuals uh, shelter um, so that they can make connection to resources and, and stabilize themselves. So yes, uh, Kenny, to answer the question, um, folks along G Street would be eligible for placement, um, remembering that they must meet uh, the code of conduct and, and adhere to the guidelines for the uh, micro shelter site. Thank you. This is probably for you too, as for you as well, Allison. How many Hilltop Thames residents have moved into permanent housing and how many are back on the streets? 
Uh, thank you, Kenny. So of the 63 uh, residents that have been served over the timeline of the micro shelter site at 8th and MLK, 12 of those have transitioned into uh, permanent housing. And I apologize, but I am going to have to defer the question for a moment on how many have returned to homelessness. I will check my uh, spreadsheet here and, and give you that number before we close out tonight. I do want folks to know that those site reports are available at cityoftacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments. You'll see a drop down menu for 8th and MLK. Uh, you can click there and the most recent site report is available for you. Thank you. Linda, can I ask you a question? Um, we have a couple people wanting to know how crime rates are measured before and during this, um, during the TEM site usage. So uh, we're fortunate to have Lieutenant uh, Gretchen Aguirre here on the call with us and she can uh, speak a, a little bit about um, what she's saying now and how we will continue to work with uh, Tacoma Police Department um, as we develop the site and as the site is, is set up. Um, but again, um, the emphasis here is, is just like our Lehigh partners were saying, um, is to actually make the, the, the location actually safer um, and, and have more eyes on it than, than it has uh, eyes on it now. Um, and and um, we will definitely uh, put together uh, information and put it on the website about calls for service in the area um, so that we can, in a very transparent way, uh, put that information out for the public. And we will also provide that information um, on a, a regular basis when we update council on the, um, on the um, uh, actions uh, uh, to, to develop the site and as we uh, move through the operations. So I don't know if Lieutenant Aguirre, if you want to comment um, or, or if, if you have any insight um, into how uh, what you're seeing from a, a police department uh, perspective around the site now, or if you want to uh, comment also uh, on what occurred when we um, implemented this type of location up at um, 8th and MLK, of, and, and how that impacted the, the safety of the community up there. Yes, um, thank you. Actually, uh, quite we with the area around there actually have had very limited activity. Um, in response, I noticed some of the questions were concerns. I can tell you I'm a Tacoma resident. I'm also a mother. And I know there was a number of concerns about um, children and also daycares um, and schools schools and the site itself is actually about three blocks from a daycare the one in uh, i should stay down the hilltop is and then also it's about five blocks from a school i um, an elementary school in, in the area but actually we really have had uh the residents in the hilltop uh, quite honestly are, are very vocal they hold us really accountable and I really appreciate the support from them and they uh, have really had no complaints and actually as mentioned about the calls for service uh, we had two there were some uh, medical calls that were there but uh, as far as loitering activity uh, the site appears to be appears really organized and self-managed geographical area and see how the calls for service are before and after at the site at 802 we did specifically the red the address itself uh, it was a little bit harder to run the geographic area because people's park would then be associated with that area and i know um, about the park and some um, uh, issues with the park and so it was hard to run the whole geographical area so we just ran specifically the site but i can tell you uh, we really just had no concerns we met beforehand with Lehigh staff um, were available if there were any issues and listed as a point of contact but uh, really not uh, like the permanent sites that we have and so uh, there's individual as mentioned earlier in their own residence and they appear very vested in the program so all right thank you and I'm sorry that question was so obviously for you I'm sorry I didn't direct it to you in the first place but thank you for answering Gretchen um, we have another comment. Um, why is it that all services, actually it's a question, so Allison, I'll throw it to you. Why is it that all services are constantly being placed in communities yes. of color? 
It's great, THA allowed the city to rent the site for free, but why is it that all services are always placed in communities of color? What we don't want on the east side is what happened on the hill. People in the community ask for resources for our community, and then we're bombarded, um, the neighborhood is bombarded with services, and suddenly we're overran with every community's homeless population, as opposed to receiving services for their own community. Can you speak to that? Thank you, Kenny. Um, I do think this is an ongoing question that we receive not only from uh, the hilltop, the east side, and the south end um, in particular. And um, to reiterate, uh, the city is very conscious of those questions and concerns. And we are looking for additional shelter location in uh, parts of the city that are not currently uh, recipients of shelter location and that is inclusive of the west end and the north end and so we are actively uh, seeking those types of locations we are looking at both public property as well as faith-based property um, in those areas so that we can look to locate um, shelter service outside some of our locations that might be more traditionally um, neighborhoods where persons of color uh, have higher concentrations in our community. So we are, um, as I said, very conscious of the concern and actively looking for additional locations. Thank you, Allison. I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm going to ask you one more equity question. What efforts has council and staff made to seek opportunities for shelters and low-income housing options in areas that have historically benefited from Tacoma's redlining practices? What role has the Office of Equity and Human Rights played in the decision to move this shelter to the east side? Thank you, Kenny. I appreciate the question and appreciate the reference to our Office of Equity and Human Rights because I do think it's important for residents to um, know and, and understand that we are committed to considering questions of equity. And those are certainly questions that um, are asked of uh, staff daily amongst staff, as well as when we bring a decision to council, uh, we do discuss equity impacts and concerns um, with those decisions. Um, what I can say with regards to our efforts to locate, um, again, shelter in places where, uh, I believe the question was, um, where folks have generally benefited from redlining districts is that, um, it is something that we've engaged in an ongoing process with the community to talk about. So if there are community members who believe they have a location that they've identified that they believe would be good for shelter, I would more than welcome uh, those suggestions because it's been an ongoing conversation and it is difficult uh, to cite shelter location and it does take a willing property owner as I touched on earlier. And so in this case, um, that willing property owner was the Tacoma Housing Authority, and we would look forward to any other willing property owner who would like to step forward um, and, and offer their location. And that is certainly something I believe also um, Council Member Ushka and Beal uh, committed to at the beginning. We know that this is a temporary location, that it will need to go elsewhere, and that we are committed to looking at those, those other districts of the city um, where we haven't currently had or do not currently have a shelter location. Thank you, Allison. I have another question for you to start with at least. As Linda Stewart mentioned, the current shelter, oh, and this comes from Megan, and that last question came from Asha. Thank you to folks who um, have shared their names and their questions. Um, as Linda Stewart mentioned, the current shelter capacity woefully does not meet the current need. This site is incredibly expensive due to wraparound services, the whole model, which is great, but not every um, houseless folk needs that, nor does it fill that gap in a big way with that amount of money. Uh, why will the city not look into alternative and expensive models like tent cities or sanctioned encampments? For the people left unhoused due to a lack of shelter, what will the city do to protect their safety and basic needs? Right now, unsheltered people are struggling with access to 24-hour access accessible bathrooms. So a couple questions in there. Let me know if you need anything repeated. 
Kenny, I'm going to start the answer, but then I am going to pass it to Linda to talk about kind of our overall approach uh, to sheltering. And, and as Linda acknowledged, we are woefully short on shelter beds. Just as we're having this conversation, we can understand the difficulty um, that is citing shelter location. Um, not only concerns and pushback from the neighborhood, but also finding, again, acceptable uh, properties where we, one, have a willing property owner, and two, where there aren't maybe some other concerns presented by that environment. Um, so shelter does remain difficult. The city is committed to providing safe shelter locations for individuals, and we do not generally believe that authorized tent cities are the way that uh, we should be going. Um, the exposure to the elements, uh, particularly during our winter seasons, is difficult. So um, in Megan's question, she asked about folks currently living unhoused and having difficulty accessing uh, services and resources. And, and frankly, in authorized, quote unquote, tent cities, um, there's still that same concern about the safety of structures, about the ongoing safety of, of those individuals. So that is why, uh, the city has chosen to pursue models like this micro shelter site in addition to sites like the stability site where we have folks um, frankly in that case we have folks both in pallet shelters and then at the present moment um, in some tents but in a larger tent where we can offer climate control and um, access to safety linda i don't know if there are additional items uh, that you heard in the question that you'd like to touch on yeah, I think so. And, and, and thanks, Megan, uh, for the question. And thanks, Allison, for, for walking us through a couple of things. The, the one thing I want to mention is that um, Pierce County, using um, some of its COVID dollars, uh, recently made an announcement uh, that they're funding a number of hygiene uh, stations uh, throughout the county and, and in the city. And these would be um, uh, offering uh, uh, hand, uh, uh, shower facilities, uh, and, and these would be um, basically um, staffed. Uh, by a provider, um, and so there will be in, in the city and outside of the city, um, restrooms, showers, et cetera, um, and this would be for, for a number of months. So, so the county and the city uh, talked about this with the health department actually um, using the health department recommendations for uh, providing increased uh, hygiene uh, facilities and amenities uh, during COVID. Uh, we also at the city uh, placed additional hygiene stations um, at existing um, uh, adjacent to existing shelter uh, locations. And so um, that is how we're looking at right now, um, managing uh, amenities that could be provided uh, for individuals to access showers, uh, uh, sanita sanitary uh, hygiene, um, places to go to the bathroom and wash their hands, basically. Um, and and the, the, the question has come up multiple times of, uh, about, uh, and I'll just say about tent cities and and why the city um, isn't supporting um, um, basically un, un, unsecure um, and unmanaged um, tent city like uh, and and the communities uh, where these locations are cited we're hearing that the communities really want um, they want a, a, a partner um, that they can count on to manage uh, the site and and it's much easier for us um, at the city to, to work with the community when we have a partner who, who is willing to 24 seven offer that, uh, that kind of security for the, for the, uh, uh, for the neighborhood. Um, and and I, I won't say security, I should say sense of security, offer that sense of security by providing a, a, a secure uh, site. Many in, um, who, are, who are residing in the, in the temporary shelter locations they appreciate that as well. They appreciate having uh, someone there uh, because what we have um, observed in, in some locations is that when we don't have um, some sort of oversight or management, um, there are some very vulnerable individuals um, in, in these locations who, who can suffer and, and be uh, 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 taken advantage of. And so, so those are some of the reasons uh, why the city is choosing uh, in its shelter, uh, its temporary shelter plan to go with an operator and a 24-7 uh, uh, approach. Thanks, Linda. We have 100 questions left um, and only 15 minutes. 
I'm gonna try to get through as many as possible. I was gonna try to end this meeting early, but if we wanna keep going to 7.30, we're gonna do it. So um, Josh, someone wants to know if um, residents have internet access. Yes. Thank you. And mm -hmm. someone else wants to know if these um, residents are primarily local or transplants. So, well, some of the residents, the residents at this new site will be transitioned over from uh, the current site, of course. And then um, the other ones will be, actually, Allison, did you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, um, as referenced uh, and Josh touched on, the fact that we will be transitioning individuals currently located at 8th and MLK over to East 60th and McKinley. Um, but what we know of individuals located in encampments and experiencing homelessness uh, throughout our community is that primarily their last known residence was here in Tacoma or in Pierce County. And that's coming from the point in time count. So um, when folks ask about, um, you know, are folks local or are they transplants, primarily the individuals that we have experiencing homelessness here in Tacoma are um, most recently residents of Pierce County. Um, so they are local, and those are the folks that we will make uh, referral to uh, this new site. Thank you. Allison, can you do an acronym check for us? Is the T for temporary, is the site what's temporary, or is the program meant to be temporary for residents? Uh, the question, generally the T in temporary is meant for the reference to the temporary nature of the location, but the ultimate goal for every resident located uh, in Thames is to make transition to permanent housing. So when we talk about uh, timeline, uh, we do uh, want them to transition into, into housing. So ideally, uh, that is also temporary, they are location there at the uh, micro shelter site. Currently, we do not have a um, 90, like at the stability site, we generally have a 90 day stay policy. At our current micro shelter site, we don't have a uh, limit on day of stays because uh, that site was always meant to uh, be in operation only for eight months. Um, but that is something that as we negotiate our contract with Low Income Housing Institute, we may look at um, going forward. All right, here's another question for you from Aaron. Is this a step toward permanent low income housing? How long do you plan on keeping the tiny houses before you break ground for permanent low income housing? Um, if the reference, uh, Kenny, is to the location at East 60th and McKinley, that property does belong to the Tacoma Housing Authority. I cannot speak to their long-term plans other than to say that we do know that they plan to develop it with uh, a combination of a number of housing options for folks in our, in our community. I can't also speak to the timeline for which uh, Tacoma Housing Authority is looking at that. What I can say is that the city is committed to removing the micro shelter site in December of 2021. Thank you. I'm going to share a comment from Veronica and after that I'll have a question for Linda. So Veronica asks or says, I live on Hilltop approximately one block from the current site. I've noticed absolutely no problems from the tiny house village being in the neighborhood and feel very safe living close by. And this is coming from someone who uses public transit and walks for my transportation. So I walk by the current site frequently, even late at night before COVID, of course. Um, I would sometimes arrive home from school as late as 1 a.m. and always felt safe. All right, so Linda, here's your question from Alyssa. What is the city doing to address the root causes of homelessness while these temps are operating um, so that we won't continue to need them? So uh, we know that homelessness affects um, uh, communities of color uh, disproportionately. And uh, what we're doing is, is several things. Uh, we're focusing resources um, into uh, uh, communities of color and, and trying to follow the um, some recommendations for prevention. So keeping people housed is actually uh, where we want to focus um, and addressing. So equity means uh, putting the resources where they're needed most. 
And so uh, coming up with uh, ways to partner with community uh, organizations uh, to, to focus our resources on uh, communities of color. Um, I'll use the rental assistance uh, program that we just established as a, a COVID response, for example. Our goal uh, for, for that program is to deliver rental assistance uh, to uh, uh, for using 45% of those dollars uh, serving uh, households of color. So really making sure that we are aware and, and working with our community partners to understand need and focusing um, the, the, the programs and the services where they're needed most. We're also working with the um, continuum of care, uh, which is a county, it's a housing and urban development uh, requirement um, at the county uh, that has an equity focus um, to understand where we might uh, better align our resources with the county and really um, encouraging the county to be uh, more um, in, the, in the conversation with us, which they are really stepping into, uh, particularly with COVID. Uh, to focus on services um, for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, so, so that's how I would answer uh, that question at, at the moment. I, I am very happy to talk with anyone very uh, more specifically about specific funded programs um, and, and our portfolio in human services. Uh, but I, I, I think for um, this conversation, that's a very detailed uh, set of information, but I'd be happy to have anyone call me uh, my number is 253-591-5225. Thanks, Linda. Um, Josh, I have a quick question for you, and then Allison will get a little bit longer one. Josh, um, someone wants to know if the MLK site offers three meals a day. I, yes, I believe it does. Great, thank you. And Allison? Um, I thought this was a really interesting question. Uh, do you anticipate home values to decrease in the area when this is implemented? And if so, what is the plan to address that? Thank you, Kenny. Uh, we don't have any research that shows for a temporary shelter location where um, the site is not permanently sited, um, that there is a decrease in home values. Um, Again, it's a temporary location. It gets removed at the at the end of 2021. And so um, I'm happy to, uh, if a person has a specific question or concern, um, we can look at whether uh, they have reason to um, make a claim to the city. Another quick question. Do you have the daily total cost per Thames resident offhand? Uh, offhand, I do not, Kenny. What I can tell you for um, this proposed site is that with setup and operation for the first six months uh, of the site, we are anticipating the cost to be between $850,000 and a million dollars uh, for the establishment of the site. Um, when folks ask about the uh, daily total cost. I think one of the um, issues is that they see the site capacity and they do some math. What that doesn't take into account is the total number of residents that that site may serve over time. So I want to caution folks that as they're thinking about that, they need to think about the total number of residents served over time. Um, and we can follow up uh, when we answer these questions uh, and post them on our website with what we're, we're running at currently. Thank you. Linda, this is a comment um, that I'm gonna direct to you. Um, it's from uh, Puyallup Tribal Council member, Annette Bryan. Um, the tribe would like to have a meeting about this. We are neighbors and must work together and communicate about these placements on the fringes of the reservation. So that's a request from the tribe. Thank you, and, and we, will, we will absolutely accommodate that request and, and work with our Government Affairs Office to, uh, to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member yeah. Ushka. Thanks, I just wanna jump in real quick and thank uh, Council Member Bryant for being here from the tribe. Uh, Chris and I will, will collaborate on setting up that meeting and I thank you for uh, reaching out to us. A question for Josh. Let's try to fit three more questions in if we can. Um, what happens to the individuals that do not abide by the rules 
um, to get into the site. Are all of them referred to other services? And what is your rate of success in this? And this might be a question for Allison too. Yeah, uh, you know, anyone who's going to be a resident um, at the Thames site has to has to sit down with us, um, look at the code of conduct, agree to it, um, mention any questions or concerns, and then if they agree to it, uh, they sign it, and then they have to abide by it. Um, when it comes to, um, actually, I wanted to see if if John is there. When it comes to somebody who is is not um, willing to do that, um, it, how how it works when it comes to referring them to another shelter, or maybe Allison can answer that. Um, but we can't. Yeah, we won't. We won't. Um, they can't. They can't cite the code of conduct. They can't live there. All right. Thank you. I think we would work with um, with the city of Tacoma in this in a case where that happens, where they should be referred to another shelter or another situation that meets their needs. We would engage with with uh, the city on that. All right, I have a question for um, Gretchen. Um, what power do the security, and this might be for Lehigh as well, but what power do the security of the facility have and how can they enforce that authority? Gretchen, I'm not sure if you heard the question. If not, Josh. Uh, Lehigh. You're breaking up. That You're breaking up a little. It's typically that their own internal internal mechanisms. Uh, I can help with that. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You've been breaking up. Why don't we have Josh answer it? For, if that's all right. So is the question is what power does security have? Is that what the question was? Yeah, and for enforcement, I suppose. Enforcement, okay. Josh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, the security, they're not like, um, you know, police officers, they're not, they're not armed or anything, um, but they, they enforce the code of conduct. Um, if somebody is not abiding by the rules and, um, you know, they're presenting um, some kind of a, safety risk, which luckily that's, I, I don't know that that's, that's happened yet, but um, it's, it's been pretty, pretty peaceful there. But if that were to happen and they would have to leave um, at that point, you know, we may need to call, um, we would have to call, you know, 911 um, if, if they're, if they're presenting some sort of a risk to the uh, residents there and, uh, and they can't be there anymore. But thankfully, I, I don't believe we've had a situation like that. Uh, Kenny, this is Allison. I just want to step into since we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing Lieutenant Aguirre. She and I spoke a little bit about this question uh, prior to the meeting today. Um, at the 8th and MLK site, we do have a uh, trespass order on file with the police department and we will work to have the same uh, piece of paperwork in place at East 60th and McKinley so that if a resident, as Josh touched on, um, is unwilling and unable to remain at the site, but is unwilling to leave, uh, the police department will have that uh, in place to assist uh, if needed in terms of, of making sure that that individual um, does, does not continue to reside on site. All right, let's try to get two more in really quick. Um, Allison, how, we're getting a lot of questions about parking, both for um, people who um, utilize the site and for um, neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. And we absolutely plan for this uh, question and concern. So there are planned parking spots uh, on the site um, looking to accommodate about six vehicles. Um, that should be enough for the uh, security on site as well as case management services. If we have a resident who comes to the site uh, and maybe has a vehicle with them. Uh, we also believe we have capacity to um, have that vehicle on site while we locate another place to store that vehicle if necessary. So if they need uh, to have access to that vehicle, um, 
we, we recognize uh, that the neighborhood has limited parking and we do want to be conscious of impacting the adjacent businesses. So we have planned uh, to accommodate parking on site. All right, Allison, I'm gonna to try to end with a little bit of a harder question. Um, I'm gonna to share Tony's question, but we got many people asking questions about how community engagement was handled. They don't feel that they were heard before the decisions were made. So can you share about how that was happened or how that community engagement went? And Tony's question is, why were we not notified about this movement before it started? There was no notification at the proposed site on the fence. Did the city council already vote on this without resident notice? Uh, Kenny, thank you for the um, question. Unfortunately, due to the restrictions of COVID-19, this outreach process has looked a little different um, than our normal outreach processes. For those who uh, went through a similar site location at 8th and MLK, you may remember that we had staff out going door to door to discuss uh, the possibility of the site location with residents. Um, unfortunately, given our current situation, that was not a possibility at uh, this time. Um, so, you know, we recognize that that's a concern. Um, about a week and a half ago, I did put signage out on the site to uh, discuss the uh, town hall. Um, also, uh, shortly, there will be site signage going out uh, on site in conjunction with the permit that is being issued uh, for the site. So um, understand uh, that there's concern about how this outreach process happened. Understand that, um, frankly, uh, having to meet with you all in a virtual uh, format is not necessarily ideal either. So, um, that, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we, I get that. Um, I do want folks, and again, I hope that folks feel that they've had an opportunity to have their questions and concerns addressed here today. I also see Linda has jumped on, so she may have some additional comments she wants to make. It, it, if you don't mind, Kenny, and thanks, Allison. And I, and I just want to underscore that, you know, we are under an emergency declaration here. And in an emergency situation, um, there, there does need to be very swift um, action uh, taken when we have identified a potential location. And, and for the community, and, and I've had uh, dozens of conversations uh, with folks who have called me directly, and please keep calling me so that we can keep the dialogue open. Uh, but when we went to council, um, that, is, that is the first step. Um, and, and then um, the next step is to start engaging uh, the community about uh, what is being planned. And, and this is your opportunity um, to, to participate in that discussion. This won't be the last um, opportunity. We will be bringing um, the contract for the operations of the site uh, to council for, for their, uh, their authorization. But again, in in terms of the emergency declaration, um, under uh, emergency situations, uh, there are many uh, times when we have to act very quickly. I want to just make sure that we also end, um, uh, or close to the end, of, of uh, reiterating our commitment to the community, just like we did up on um, 8th and MLK, to, to having the location operated safely in a manner that um, is, um, is very minimal impact to the community and, and in a manner where the community sees this as actually an asset. You've heard from a couple folks um, uh, um, in the comments, um, and there are multiple other comments that I'm seeing when I'm reading the comments, um, that this does, uh, it is a good neighbor to, to the 8th and MLK uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, but just like we were uh, very specific with that neighborhood about removing the, or, or the uh, temporary shelter site, um, on time, uh, we will remain uh, true to that commitment uh, to, to you, your neighbor, you and your neighborhood here. Uh, and, and again, um, please uh, uh, keep, keep uh, us aware of your concerns. Call me, call Allison, uh, call your council members, come to these uh, meetings, um, help us understand your concerns, but know that we want to mitigate the impacts uh, to your neighborhood as well as mitigating the impacts uh, for uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness and help move them through uh, their transition to uh, becoming housed. 
So, so with that, um, Kenny, are, are we, where are we? We're just about done. I just wanted to let people know we have n over 90 questions that we weren't able to get to yet. This is, I just wanted to let y'all know, I'm so proud of Tacoma. This is the most engagement we've ever had at one of our virtual meetings. This is something brand new that we're trying out and clearly y'all want to be heard. Um, we are really committed to making sure you get answers to all your questions. So um, in a day, we're gonna post this video so you can share it with your friends and neighbors. And then as soon as we can get to answering all the questions in that video that we share, will then post a document that has all of your answers. So we're gonna to get to as many as we can. If you have more questions, I've, I'm sure Allison will want you to email shelters at cityoftacoma.org. So please um, go there. I'm Kenny Colwell. I've been really happy to be sharing your questions and to be a part of this with all of you. Um, you can always reach out to me if there's anything I can do for you too. I work on community engagement at the city. So Allison, will you give us some closing thoughts, please? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Linda, for your conversation around being a part of an open dialogue. So uh, thank you to the community. As Kenny said, this has been our highest engagement yet in one of these virtual formats. So we very much appreciate you all um, being willing to engage with us in this way. Um, as Kenny said, this uh, presentation will go up on uh, the website within a day, and in the next few days, We'll be able to co collate all your questions, your comments, and provide response to those. We'll also be passing all of your questions and comments to both the council members on this call as well as the mayor. So we want to make sure that uh, you know that all of those will be provided um, to your elected officials. As Kenny said, please remember to email us at shelters at cityoftacoma.org or call me directly 253-591-5119 should you have questions or concerns that you don't feel were addressed today. Also, please visit our website at cityoftacoma.org forward slash authorized encampments if you'd like to be subscribed to our ongoing list uh, regarding this project and regarding um, our approach to homelessness. So thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining us in this format. And we really appreciate it. And we'll be uh, in touch with more information virtually on uh, the coming days.